Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Vanessa Rule. I'm the lead organizer and co-director for 350 Vermont, and it's wonderful to see you here tonight. Um, and thank you to the Montpelier Node and to this church for um, hosting this series this summer. It's been really successful, it sounds like. And so tonight we're going to be talking about how we connect all the pieces and what we can do um, in 2025-2026. Um, how many of you here came to one of the previous series this summer? Just show of hand. Great. Well, thanks for coming back. Um, so, yeah, housekeeping, take care of yourself. Bathrooms are over here and over there. Um, are there any other needs that people have in the room that we should be mindful of? Okay, we have a video, we have a speaker, um, so hopefully you'll be able to hear, but let us know if you can't hear. Um, at the end of do you want to pass out the next eight sheets now? Or? Yes. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to pass out uh, sticky notes. And we're going to be throwing a lot of information at you tonight. And the goal is not for you to remember it all or even understand it all, frankly, um, because there's just so much. It's really to, we want to give you an overview of sort of how we're thinking about pursuing a just transition. Um, and what the different elements are. And we would love to hear from you what you're most moved by and what you feel called to work on. And at the end of the, of the workshop, we'll give you a chance to fill out a form that, where you can say, this is what I'm interested in, um, so that we get a sense of where the energy is. Because we can't do this work unless people are excited about it. So um, Rebecca is passing out these sticky notes and you can put your questions on there if we don't get to them we'll make sure that we follow up and answer them take a couple do that all right so we're going to start with the land acknowledgement um everybody could center for a minute um and i want to acknowledge that we are gathering here today on uh unceded abenaki territory and as I was thinking about tonight, I was wondering what Montpelier looked like in 1721 um, when colonizers came um, to create Montpelier. And I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, a lot of what we're fighting is an extractive system um, that really started at that time where people came and decided to take from people take from the land to produce wealth and power. And this work is about changing that relationship. It's about settling back into right relationship with the land, with each other, um, you know, with the people who belong here. So as we think about taking action together, I would ask all of you to think about what you can be doing right now to help us move back in that direction. So just quickly, 350 Vermont um, is a people-powered movement. Our whole approach is about, we believe that the people together can create change um, and that we should be, you know, having a broader decision-making table. Uh, we're guided by the voices, experiences, and solutions of the most impacted by the climate crisis. We strive to work at the intersection of the climate crisis and social justice to address the climate crisis equitably and effectively. So we're not just about reducing carbon emissions and you know re retrofitting our current economy, but really thinking about the how, like who's going to benefit, who's going to lose out, um, how do we make sure that everybody is able to move forward. And so what do we want? We want healthy people, communities, ecosystems, and planet. We want affordable, low-polluting energy for all. And we know that in order to have a livable planet, we need to stop burning things. So we're going to talk about that tonight. 
So just to, we're just gonna briefly talk about our agenda for the evening. Um, so we're gonna do a little more welcome and introductions and also a chance for you all to get to chat with one another a bit. Um, we're gonna talk about what we hope you all all leave here tonight with. Um, we're also gonna talk about where we are now. So the progress we've made so far, um, also the, ut the utilities and what, um, how they're affecting our progress and the work still to do. Um, very importantly, we're going to talk about what are we doing um, in the next two years and how you all can plug in. And um, like Vanessa said, at the end, there's going to be um, forms for everyone to fill out with a bunch of different ways um, you can decide to be, be part of this and make a change. Um, so three things we'll hope you'll come away with. First of all, we want folks to leave with an understanding of why we need to stop burning things and also what we can do differently, alternatives um, that we need to be working for. Uh, second, we want folks to have a general understanding of ways we can take action in the coming couple years. And then we want folks to feel like they leave with really clear next steps for ways that they can engage and take action. And Andres is gonna come up and tell us about our parish. And Andres is our um, awesome new community organizer who I'm so excited to get to work with, with Vanessa. Um, and here we go. I think I'm more excited about working with Catholic, but. <laughs> um, hi all, again, like Rebecca just said, I'm Andres. And so to start today's conversation, we're gonna do a little bit of dialogue with each other. We're gonna break out into a little period and chairs, so maybe, you know, group up with the person who's to your left or to your right. Um, and these are the questions that we're gonna start off in conversation. Uh, you can share your name, your pronouns, the town that you live in, um, experiences, and uh, what your experience is with climate action, with climate policy, environmental action, environmental justice, um, what you know or what you don't know. Um, and then the last one, let's take a little extra moment to really focus in on that. Like, how are you feeling about the impacts of energy and climate change? We're all in Montpelier, right? We know that the tragic reality of the last few years of flooding in this, in this city and surrounding areas. And so, how does that feel? What is the impact on your body, your heart, your mind? Um, and with that, why don't we go ahead and pair and share? And so you'll have 10 minutes? Oh yes, 10 minutes. Yeah, five minutes each. And we're keeping a timer, we'll switch on and to switch. All right, well it sounds like you have some rich conversations. Um, does anybody want to throw out something you've heard that moved you in particular, that surprised you? Yeah. It's not a surprise, but um, Daniel was sharing, he's originally from the West Coast, and he was sharing um, just that when he was growing up, wildfires were a non-issue, non non-thing. And the 2017, he said, was when they first started, and it's been every, every year since then. That was uh, being a problem. Yeah. yeah. And um, I was just, him bringing that up just reminded me that, oh yeah, that's very true. It wasn't that long ago that this was not a huge issue. Um, and it is, it's a really big issue now. So, I don't know, just I thought that was worth remembering. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else want to share? No pressure. Mm -hmm. I think the last, whether it's five years or ten years, whatever we've definitely gone from, it's coming to its year. Um, but one thing that I heard that I really liked was what Michelle shared with me, that uh, this is her first time at a 350 event, and um, she was pleased that it wasn't a lot of doom and gloom, which I agree with. Like, there's something motivating about, about doom and gloom, but there's also um, something motivating about coming together with a group of like-minded people and being committed to, to solutions, and not just promoting where we are today. Thank you, that's perfect. Um, so, you all sort of covered it, right? It's happening, things have shifted, and we have to continue to work together to have hope. Um, I did want to give us just a couple of markers in terms of where we are, um, if, in case you're not clear. I think one of the things we're really, um, I know when 
we're working on policy stuff, on anything that we do. It feels like it's going to take some time, and we just don't have time anymore. Um, we are inching closer and closer to that 1.5 degrees Celsius tipping point. Um, the point at which, um, you know, by 2040 potentially, we will not be able to alter the course of the climate because of feedback loops. And um, this is something that I want to draw attention to because we talk a lot about technology um, and we talk a lot about reducing carbon emissions, but we don't talk a whole lot about protecting our carbon sinks and nature as a core component of this transition. Uh, this graph shows the rate, if you can see from like 2000 to 2022, uh, the increase in use of uh, emissions or the increase in emissions from fossil carbon, but you can also see how filled up the, um, the carbon sinks are getting on the bottom of the horizontal line, the atmosphere, land sinks, ocean sinks. Uh, apparently the rainforest is now producing carbon because of burning. Um, so we need to protect our carbon sinks, and this is a big part of sort of what we're working on. So where is there hope? Well, we know that organized people can make meaningful change, and so we thought we would lift up a few things that we've done um, as a result of so many people like you um, in the last few years. One thing that we did was we were able to get some uh, guardrails around the use of biofuels in um, our heating um, sector uh, bill, the Clean Heat Standard, which passed in 2022. Um, last year, we worked together to increase the amount of uh, energy that needs to come from solar and wind from less than 10%, and that was a maximum of 10%, to uh, a minimum of 40%, um, which was a huge, huge progress. We took the first step at um, ensuring that ratepayers don't pay more than their fair share for energy. Um, and so the Public Utility Commission is working on that right now. And uh, we hope to have a bill in 2026 to make sure that, um, that people don't pay more than 6% of their income for electricity, or, uh, if they're low income, or 10% if they're middle income. Um, we're giving towns new tools like thermal energy networks, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we, the, there's a 30 by 30 land protection bill that requires 30% of Vermont's land to be conserved by 2030. And uh, the Climate Superfund law, which makes emission, uh, high emissions corporations pay for some of the climate damages to help this transition. So that's a lot for a little state like Vermont. And that really is thanks to all the, the pressure that people have, you know, put on legislators. Other things that we've done collectively, um, there's, I don't know how many of you have heard of the McNeil biomass plant that's in Burlington. Raise your hand if you have. Okay. So, you know, two years ago when we were talking about this, people would say like, oh, we can't touch McNeil. And now, you know, the mayor's talking about phasing it out. Um, we are building uh, relationships across um, Vermont organizations to really try to work more inter intersectionally. And we're also starting to address sort of where our money is going in terms of um, maintaining fossil fuel infrastructure and calling for that to be shifted to um, low emission solutions. So we need to keep organizing, and there are not enough of us doing this. There are a lot of us who are doing a lot, but we just need more people. Um, and social movements are what has you know, changed the world uh, over and over again. And I love this image of the people don't need their true power, because this really is how it works. And I think people forget that. So just keep that in mind. Um, the way we understand climate change um, at 350 Vermont is that it's not a technical problem, it's a power problem. It's that there are some people um, that are making decisions for all of us about energy that are focused on making profits and at the expense of people and the planet. Um, and that's that extractive approach that I was talking about before that we're trying to shift. And we understand in that like, we want a seat at the table. And so we are coming together um, to, to counteract those special interests. And the way we work 
is reorganizing our communities, like here tonight, we're gonna to be holding 10 more of these. Um, we have what we call nodes uh, all over um, the state, and you'll hear from one of our node leaders. Um, and then we pull together to raise our voices collectively uh, with our allies to push for this transition. Um, and we're part of a regional network, um, you know, of a lot of different organizations and working in, in coalition, so we're not alone. And we're also part of a national movement um, with 350.org and People's Action and Third Act and others. Okay, so I'm gonna pass the mic to Heather. Hi, I'm Heather Johnson and I'm a Calis resident. Um, I am not a leader, but I am a member of the, the Montpelier group. Um, we, I started, I joined about three years ago when this chapter of this group started up and really I just was probably like a lot of us feeling very um, worried and concerned and the weight of the responsibility of the future was just weighing heavily on me and this was a way to get involved and plug in um, and it definitely helped me focus some of those feelings and feel like I was doing something. Um, and with that, I, I do want to also say that we're wrapping up this summer series. This is our last event for this series. <laughs> and we're meeting again in two weeks. We meet twice a month. And anybody who'd like to join us at the next one or any of the future ones, and uh, get involved, um, we would love to have you there and have more voices contributing to figuring out what we wanna focus on through the winter and going forward. The next meeting is going to be October 9th and um, it's 5.30 to 7. And it's upstairs at the Hunger Mountain Co-op in the community room. You can indicate on the form if you wanna come or you can just show up. Um, like I said, we'd love to see you, so that's it. Oh, and there are no, no other Node members here tonight as well. Not everyone could make it, but. Thank you, Heather. Do uh, Node members want to raise their hands? Um, okay, so, oh, the pizza is coming. That was one thing that just. <laughs> all right, so this isn't all doom and gloom, but I'm gonna ask you all, because we're going to talk about what we can do together. Um, why do you think climate change is still happening? Like, what's getting in the way of this transition? Any thoughts? Money. Greed. Say, do you want to say more about that? Greed and money. Okay. Corporations, greed and money. Corporations, okay. Yeah? Anyone else? Bureaucracy. Oh, say more about that. Just... You mean procedures and? I think of something very specific about the weatherization program where 10% of some of our older buildings will not get weatherized, not because they're not eligible, but because the program is administered through the Department of Human Service as opposed to a climate focused group. Yeah. So I could give you the nitty gritty details, but that's the Great. overall. Yeah. So about. institutional structures. Our collective personal addictions to rural sprawl living and the personal car make it <laughs> impossible for us to do the systematic changes that will be required to actually do real uh, reduction in carbon demand. Great. So we need to shift the way we're living. Yeah, Bob, one last. Uh, lack of truth in the media. They'd rather not talk about it or present faults. And why do you think that is? It's more popular to talk about the, the, the devastation and whatever else. You know, it's all about money that they make from advertisement. Okay, last comment. There's low-hanging fruit that we don't pick. 
Why, why aren't we doing that? I don't know. But okay. in the 70s, when there was a, an alleged fuel crisis, we slowed down to 55 miles an hour on the highway and saved fuel. Consumption of fuel and production of carbon are directly linked. Yep. If we drove 55 miles an hour on the highway today, we'd be producing a lot less carbon. Yeah. Okay, it's thank easy. you. You just have to leave 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> so that would be good. That would make a big difference. So there are small things we can do. Um, I think, you know, our understanding is that fundamentally there's still a lot of money to be made. Um, and there's an inertia in the system. I mean, this is complicated. This is a hard transition. But this is why we need to show up to keep, because it's hard for some of these decision makers to make that shift. And so they need to have the people power behind them. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about a lot of things. And um, you're, it's okay if you don't absorb it all. Um, we will share this presentation. and. There are going to be many uh, opportunities to ask questions um, tonight and down the road. So, um, I'm going to start with the gloom, and then we'll, start, we'll go to the, the empower, empowerment. But, because, you know, I've been doing this for 18 years. My kids were 3 and 6 when I started. They're 22 and 25. And I look at those graphs, and i just not happy. Um, so, why is this happening? Um, so in Vermont, in the last three years, we have seen how corporate interests um, and the Scott administration have consistently um, gotten in the way of climate progress. Um, they continue to invest in climate change causing infrastructure and fuels. Um, they're shaping Vermont's energy policy and advocating for loopholes. Um, they are replacing fossil fuels with comparably polluting fuels and calling them renewable. And they're you know, weakening our ability to build and afford um, solar, um, which is one of the solutions. So here are a couple of examples. We know that um, this morning there was an article in, the, um, in, Vermont, in the Vermont edition, I think, um, that talked about the Conservation Law Foundation is suing the Agency of Nat Natural Resources for not counting our greenhouse gas emissions properly. Um, the um, Vermont Gas helped write one of our core climate pieces of policy, which you know foundationally is important and we need it. Um, and there's a lot that's good about it, but it still has corporate interests in there way too much. Um, you know, in 2023, when uh, new legislators were elected, um, they had a week or a few days with Green Mountain Power, and that's how they learned about the energy system. So who is in the state house uh, framing the issue? Um, I won't go on, but you know, there are very, very concrete examples that, that we have seen, and we need to be addressing that corporate power. Um, I want to focus on one thing. You know, one of the things I showed earlier is the importance of carbon sinks. And Vermont is a very, thinks of itself as a progressive state, which in some ways it is. Um, but our utilities have identified that Vermonters want us to move off fossil fuels. And their plan is to replace those fossil fuels with biofuels. And those are incredibly polluting. And so we need to make sure that, you know, when we have something like the clean heat standard, that weatherization is, um, is what's opted for heat pumps, thermal energy networks, geothermal. Um, because otherwise what we're going to do is spend this very narrow window of time replacing one really bad source of fuels with a really bad, another bad source of fuels. Um, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but um, we do have some examples. Um, this is uh, Vermont Gas just signed a contract with the largest landfill in New York State um, to bring what's called renewable natural gas, um, which is basically gas that um, is actually by law mandated to be destroyed at that landfill so that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. Instead, it's going to get piped in that red pipeline, which is a leaky pipeline, because pipelines leak, and this renewable natural gas is methane. It's not different from frac gas. And Vermont Gas gets to get credit for that as renewable energy. Um, and that sort of offsets you know, some of their, that, that 
moves to the um, to the meeting that that um, Queen people. So we don't think this is a really viable source of um, of renewable energy. Um, same thing with liquid biofuels. Um, there are some biofuels out there that are you know, better than others and not as emitting as others. The problem is that the demand for biofuels globally is huge because aviation, a lot of you know, countries are going to biofuels. So when we in Vermont take a portion of biofuels off the market, that gets replaced by the cheapest source of biofuels on the planet, which is palm oil. Um, and palm oil is um, grown um, you know, in countries like uh, Borneo and Malaysia um, and destroying rainforest. And then finally, we have utilities that are still investing in uh, burning wood. And you know, we're not talking about um, wood stoves. Uh, we know that wood is a big part of Vermont's culture and at scale, uh, wood is really polluting. And I think a lot of people think of it in this way that, well, you grow a tree and then like the carbon gets reabsorbed. The problem is the rate at which that happens. Um, so, you know, with fossil fuels, you have, um, you know, you're increasing emissions. Uh, wind and solar, no increase in emissions, and uh, wood actually is still increasing emissions. So that is something we really need to um, nip in the bud because we are seeing uh, new projects pop up all over the place um, to burn more wood. Okay. And then who's financing all this stuff? Um, so there's money, you know, people say, well, that's gonna cost a lot of money to transition. Um, right now, our utilities are, um, since 2010, have gotten paid $143 million to keep um, peaker plants open, which are little plants across the state that are there just in case um, we end up using more electricity than usual, like on the hottest or coldest days of the year. They run less than 1% um, than of the time. And we think that those plans should be shut down as they are in New York State and other states, and that we should be investing that money in low emissions um, sources like weatherization and geothermal heat pumps, et cetera. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that burning things has huge environmental impacts. So it's not just about the climate, it's about people's health. Vermont has some of the highest asthma rates in the country uh, because of the use of biomass. Um, and a lot of these um, fuels are, and plants are uh, placed in, um, in low income and often communities of color, um, communities. And, you know, we need to be thinking about um, who is, uh, holding the burden of our energy use. And in Vermont, you know, there are something like 48 gas plants across the New England region. There's not one in Vermont. So like these lights right now uh, are in part coming from natural gas. And somebody's kid is hurting right now as a result. Okay, so, you know, our question is to our elected officials and our power companies is, are you gonna keep investing in burning infrastructure and polluting, or can we start using that money to help us transition to clean and just energy? So, um, how do we do that? Um, we're gonna cover that, so we're gonna go a little bit more into sort of what we need to do to stop burning things this year, and then what can we do um, to put us on an alternative path. So the first thing we need to do is conserve. Um, I think you talked about the fact that we can't, you know, we're, we're consuming too much. Um, I think it's something like 5% of the population in the U.S. is consuming 25% of the world's resources. Um, there are lots of things we can do, like weatherization, uh, demand response. Um, we need to make this affordable for everybody. This can't just be accessible to wealthy people. Uh, which right now it is. Um, I live in Stratford in the Upper Valley and you know something like 35 families pulled their savings together to build a solar array, which is great, but that's not accessible to most people. Um, we need to uh, basically electrify. That's really how we stop burning things and we need to make sure that that electricity comes from, from solar and wind. It's really not that complicated and Jonathan is gonna tell us about what that looks like in Vermont. Um, in a little while. And the 
last thing is we need to stop burning things. Like we need to get on a path to shut things down. We can't do it overnight. We need to make sure that the workers, you know, for these plants have good jobs. But it is crazy at this point in time that we're continuing to add carbon to the atmosphere and signing deals um, with landfills that are going to keep us emitting carbon. Okay. Is it your turn? I think it's still your turn. Oh. So that was a whole bunch of stuff that we want to work on. Is anyone a little overwhelmed? Or like mildly? Are we just are we gonna do it all? The general state of affairs. <laughs> um, so what are we gonna do this year over the next couple of years? So these are our priorities in terms of tangible things that we can work on, hopefully all of us together. So on the stop burning side of things, we have de-incentivizing biofuels in the clean clean heat standards, so that's um, making sure that those get counted accurately in terms of what their emissions effects are throughout their entire life cycle. Um, getting utilities to commit to shutting down all of those plants that burn things. So we're talking about McNeil and Burlington, the Rygate plant, all the peaker plants, um, and to basically stop putting in infrastructure that is going to continue to burn things. Um, what do we want to create? What do we want to see? So we want to see affordable community solar. We want to make sure that landlords are required to weatherize their rental units. Um, we also want to cap electricity costs. So as we electrify, um, as people transition to maybe heating their homes with things like cold climate heat pumps, we also want to make sure that people's energy burden, so the amount of their income they're paying um, toward their energy doesn't increase. Um, we want money from the Inflation Reduction Act to make sure that it actually goes to our communities. Um, we want to build thermal energy networks, and we also want to make sure we increase and also protect our public transportation. So we're going to talk. We're going to talk first a bunch about the things we need to stop burning, and then we're going to go into the things we want a little more in depth. Um, for the things we need to stop burning, number one, we talked about we need to disincentivize biofuels in our clean heat standard, and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. And then number two, utilities need to stop investigating in burning infrastructure. Um, so we're going to um, hear a video from Ava, who's done a bunch of work on um, learning about the clean heat standard. And Vanessa, I'm going to let you introduce a little more about this. Yeah, so before we start, um, I just want to acknowledge that a lot of people have put a ton of work into the clean heat standard, and one of the big goals of that policy is to regulate fuel dealers, which is incredibly important. Uh, our electricity sector right now is not is regulated, um, so we can you know ask the utilities to increase the amount of electricity that they get from solar and wind. We can't do that with our heating uh, utilities, Vermont Gas and uh, the fuel dealers. So that's critical, but we need to make sure that what is considered clean heat is actually low emissions. Um, and so this short video is going to talk a little bit about what is still considered um, clean heat that we want to make sure doesn't get as much uh, traction and how you can participate in that. to talk to you about the clean heat standard, our concerns with it, how corporate interests have played a role in influencing it, and what we can do to make our voices heard and, and tell the Public Utilities Commission that we need to stop burning things for fuel. Um, and we want cleaner solutions because we, we have them and we can incentivize them. So a little background on the clean heat standard. Um, it's, a, it's a framework uh, and the goal is to try and reduce the thermal sector emissions that we have in Vermont now. So the thermal sector is mainly hot water and heating buildings. Heating buildings is, is a main part of the thermal sector. Um, they they want to do this by regulating the fuel dealers and our gas utility. Uh, so under the clean heat standard, the amount of emissions that a fuel dealer can produce is limited. They can either reduce their emissions um, or they can buy their way out of it. Uh, so it's a credit-based system. So by reducing their emissions, they can gain credits or they can buy those credits from other entities who are generating the credits. 
So how do you generate the credits? You generate credits through um, 12 clean heat measures that are outlined in the law. Each source of clean heat has a value, and, and that value is determined by the amount of pollution it gives off throughout its life cycle. So these emissions values for the clean heat sources are being decided right now. There are a few different issues that we're going to outline, and I'll give you sort of an overview of them now. The first is that biofuels and hydrogen are included as clean heat measures. The second is the way that biofuels and hydrogen um, emissions factors are being calculated right now. And the third is that corporate interests have played a huge role in influencing this bill throughout its lifespan. Um, so let's get started on talking about the first issue, which is that biofuels and hydrogen are included as clean heat measures. Um, we know there's a lot of science out there that points to the fact that they actually have really high greenhouse gas emissions. Um, they have really negative impacts on our health, and they have really sort of important, grave environmental justice implications. Um, so they are included along really clean and important solutions, like heat pumps, like weatherization, and like thermal energy networks. So a little background on what biofuels are. It's liquid, it's solid, and it's gas fuel that is created through organic material. This includes renewable natural gas, biomass, and biodiesel. Um, we'll, we have um, a bunch of information in the back about uh, each one of these sources. We don't have time to get into it too much right now, but um, we do have more information in the back. And again, these sources of fuel are false solutions. They pr pollute as much as fossil fuels. Some, some research state says that they actually pollute more. Um, they are not scalable, they're costly, and they're extremely inequitable. Um, and because they're using the same systems that we run on now, they will allow fossil fuel companies to continue to profit off of polluting our air and exploiting our earth and exploiting frontline communities. This is not the route that we want to go. Um, a little bit about hydrogen. Um, putting hydrogen into our pipeline actually increases our emissions and ensures that we continue to burn things. Um, hydrogen will often be blended with gas, so it's continuing our reliance on fossil fuels. Hydrogen is a really powerful greenhouse gas, um, and so you know, allowing it to leak out of our pipelines um, because we do have a very leaky pipeline infrastructure will increase emissions. So, you know, all in all, biofuels and hydrogen are not clean heat measures, they're not clean heat sources, and they are counted as such within the clean heat standard. Unfortunately, we can't remove biofuels and hydrogen from the clean heat standard at this moment, but what we can do is we can try to make sure that the emissions from biofuels and hydrogen are counted accurately. This would deter fuel dealers from using biofuels and hydrogen and push them towards real solutions like weatherization and heat pumps. Because the amount of credits that you get from, from executing one of these clean heat measures will determine how much they're incentivized. So unfortunately, we know that already emissions aren't being accounted accurately. So that is problem number two. Problem number one was that we're including these in these bills. And problem number two is that they are not being counted accurately. The gas and biofuel industry have done a great job at greenwashing biofuels and hydrogen, um, and a lot of the industry standard models inaccurately count the emissions from burning biofuels. Um, the models consider the emissions when burning the biofuels biogenic, which means that are, they are released from organic matter. They count them as part of the, the natural life cycle of it, um, but we know that's false. Um, human activity has a major impact on um, the release of greenhouse gas emissions from this organic material, um, and so not counting these emissions is extremely inaccurate. And biogenic is just another way to greenwash the emissions from, from these fuels. Biogenic emissions are still emissions. They're still methane, they're still carbon dioxide, they're still nitrous oxide that's being released into the atmosphere, and the only thing that's different about them is the name. So we've seen so far is that reports um, that are coming out with the clean heat standard, they undercount the emissions from biofuels. They don't count biogenic emissions. Um, and we've also seen reports with inaccurate data. Um, in a recent report, we have seen that um, in 2035, um, according to the data that they have produced, 
the fuel with the least amount of carbon intensity is biomethane, and that is over grid electricity. And to note something is that by 2035, grid electricity will be 100% renewable in Vermont. Um, and so they are, they, are, they are considering biomethane to be even more um, climate friendly than grid electricity, even though grid electricity will be um, fully renewable by 2035. So that's, that is something that shows that there's real concern in this area because that means that those fuels that are counted as more climate friendly than 100% renewable, renewable grid electricity will be incentivized within this standard. Unfortunately, we can continue to expect these outcomes until we stand up and we make our voices heard and we will get to how we can do that um, right after this. Problem number three that we have is the corporate interests that have been influencing this bill from the start. Um, the fuel industries have had a really large influence over the clean heat standard um, right when it got started. Um, in 2020, many employees of Vermont Gas Systems were involved in writing it, including um, employees from Green Mountain Power and Burlington Electric Department, and actually the current and former CEOs of Vermont Gas Systems. Um, right now, we see um, the biofuels industry is heavily represented on the technical advisory group. So the technical advisory group is a group that will give the final recommendation of the Clean Heat Standard to the Public Utilities Commission and the legislature. So the technical advisory group has a lot of say in the emissions values for the Clean Heat Standard. And the biofuels industry um, has three individuals who are sitting on the technical advisory group and there is also another individual just from the fuel industry. So they're, they're very vocal people and they're very vocal about wanting biofuels to be, to have the, the best value so that they can profit off of it. And this group will give the final recommendation to the Public Utilities Commission and the legislature. So it, that is really important. Um, these industries have a vested interest in the clean heat standard um, because they want a clean heat standard that will incentivize biofuels um, and heat sources that help their business models. Um, these businesses are based on profit, so they want to prioritize their profits. Uh, we believe that you know they do they do want solutions, but um, you know profit is the driver of their business, and so um, they want uh, the standard that will help them increase those things. The other issue is that this is a market-based model. You can easily buy your way out. We have seen you know, cap and trade systems like this, credit systems, market-based models. Um, we've seen them fail because they, don't, they aren't built to hold corporations accountable. Um, they are built to sort of let them buy their way out. And in this case, you know, they can buy their way out through um, buying clean heat credits from other sources. So this is a timeline of the clean heat standard process. As you can see, it is very convoluted, which is you know another concern. It's really hard for us as you know concerned Vermonters to stay involved because it is so complicated to understand. Um, and folks who are on these groups um, also are not fully aware of how the process is going to go. Um, so just as an overview. Um, some of the issues we have, the first issue is that uh, biofuels and hydrogen are included in the clean heat standard. Our second issue is that um, the data and models that are coming out don't accurately count emissions from biofuels and, and hydrogen, which means that they are incentivized um, in this bill and that there is a lot of influence of industry in this bill, skewing it towards biofuels um, and towards hydrogen, which are fuels that will, you know, make them the most money um, and are already adhering to their business model. So we need a clean heat standard that is driven by science and justice um, and not driven by profits. So we need to get corporations out of our policy making. Um, what that means for right now is, is that if emissions from biofuels aren't counted accurately, fuel companies will reach their credit goals through biofuels and hydrogen, and not through real solutions like weatherization, heat pumps, thermal energy networks, and solar. If this is the case, wealthy people are gonna be the only ones to be able to get off of fossil fuels. Um, and getting off of fuel, fossil fuels has a lot of, or fossil fuels or fuels in general, so that includes biofuels, has a lot of financial and health benefits. Um, and without 
laws to help low and middle income Vermonters um, get off of fossil fuels, then only wealthy people will reap those benefits. Um, if that's the case, then low and middle income households will be stuck burning fuel. And because we, as consumers, pay for the infrastructure, the fewer people who are on that infrastructure will be paying, the, the individuals who are stuck on it will be paying more. So low and middle income households will have a higher energy burden without legislation and regulation that helps them get off of fuels and helps them weatherize and you know, install heat pumps and have thermal energy networks. So our main takeaways that we have today is that um, biofuels aren't clean. They are not the solution. They are really harmful to our health. Burning anything is really harmful to our health. It you know, increases our risk of respiratory illness. It increases our risk of cancer. There are a lot of really harmful, dangerous to, to burning things. Um, and we have the solutions. We have weatherization. We have heat pumps. We just need to incentivize it. And this bill is a way to do that to have real clean heat measures valued with a higher credit value so that they will be incentivized within this bill and fuel dealers will have no choice but to utilize real clean heat to get to their clean heat standard quota. So as I said before, the emission values are being decided right now um, and that is where you come in. So we have put together a letter to a pub the Public Utilities Commission um, that you can sign. You can also make a public comment to the Public Utilities Commissions. We will have handouts on certain things that you, uh, certain resources you can pull from, um, and certain ideas of comments. But feel free to take um, your own direction. You can also write a letter to the editor. Um, there are also resources on that, um, and you can also reach out to me if you want support in doing this. Um, you can also sign up to learn how we might engage with this during the legislative session. Um, the clean heat standard will go back to the legislature um, this next session and they will ultimately decide whether they want to pass it through or if they want to, to stop it. Um, and then you can also sign up to be part of our clean heat standard team that is working on the issue. Okay, that was a lot of information. Um, so to be clear, the clean heat standard is you know, a tool that we need. Hi everyone, Oops. my name is Ava Moore. Um, we you. just really need to make sure that the, the things we don't want in there are not in there. Um, so that's the takeaway. Um, Vanessa, do you want to pass these around? Questions? Sure, go ahead. So if folks want to sign the petition now um, about um, how the um, PUC is going to Hi everyone, my name is Ava Morgan. Thank you. Uh, I see this. And I am organizing your Um, and also, if people don't want to, like, you can look, the letters on the front here, if you turn the page, there's a place to sign. If you don't want to read a whole thing right now, we will also send a link to this so you can look at it in your own time and decide if you want to sign it digitally. And all the things Ava mentioned, we, you will have forms at the end where you can check off, like, yes, I want to do this thing. So you don't have to hold it all over your head. Okay. That was a lot, and that's basically, you know, sort of the main takeaway right now is we just can't transition from fossil fuels to these other things, and there's a huge amount of advocacy right now to do that. Um, and the fear is that we're going to get these fuels in place, and then we're going to, you know, basically say we're done. Like, we have fixed the climate problem in Vermont, uh, which is sort of what happened in our electricity sector, um, and thankfully we're working to fix that. Um, so just quickly, I'm not going to belabor this because we really want to move to the positive, exciting stuff and what we can do. Um, but there are people working in Burlington. Uh, we have a node in Chittenden County that's actively working to stop the uh, McNeil biomass expansion, working with the city council. Um, so that's something that's happening. And then there's another thing. There's a, a proposed biomass plant in Linden uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, that is currently expedited, uh, fast tracked without any public process uh, or public comments. And so we're working hard to uh, extend that to a regular public process. And so if you know anybody in the Northeast Kingdom who might be interested, uh, please let us know. We have a petition out there that's on our website. Um, I think we've gotten over 300 signatures. Um, 
we want to deliver the signatures by next Tuesday to the Public Utility Commission. Okay. Um, this is a new thing that's also popping up. This is really like playing whack-a-mole. Um, we're sort of tired. Um, there's uh, talk of pipelines in Addison County um, that that is being that's sort of rear its, rearing its head again. Um, and so we have our Addison County node is working on that. I wish I had more information for you about that, but um, I'm just learning about it. So that was what they had a few years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. So the good thing is we've done this before, but we need to do it again. Um, all right, we're gonna take a break, um, and then we're gonna talk about what we want, and we're gonna hear from Jonathan, who's gonna talk about how we build out um, community solar um, and solar in general and what, and yeah, get your thoughts about that um, in addition to um, weatherization and, and other solutions. So thanks for listening. We'll be back in five minutes. So this is the part where we get to talk about like, what do we wanna create and what do we wanna see? of the, um, the between Burlington, the bus between Burlington and Montpelier. Has anyone heard of that? Oh, no, I didn't know. So oh, I'm we need more transportation and it's getting cut. So this is something we really want to work on. Um, what can you do? Um, we have a group of folks in our Chittenden node who are working on this. Um, and certainly folks from Montpelier could join that group as something that affects you all as well. Um, we can also talk to our legislators. Um, we can talk to our local municipalities who help fund GMT. Um, and there's also, um, we'll send this slideshow and the links. You can go to the, the link up there and there's a, um, you can share your story of how transportation or the lack of transportation affects you. We also really at the core of what we wanna do is make tra this transition affordable and accessible to everyone. And unfortunately, that's not really the way it is right now. So three things in this realm we wanna see. Um, one, we wanna see rental weatherization. So we, we mentioned this at the beginning, we wanna make sure that renters also have access to lowering their heating bills by weatherizing their homes, their, the units they're renting. We want ratepayer protection, so again, that's making sure um, folks don't have to pay an undue energy burden, especially to transition to things like cold climate heat pumps. Um, and then we also want to make sure that um, Inflation Reduction Act funds can be accessed both by our, our communities, our town, and also by individuals and seeing what we can do about some of the barriers um, that are sort of implicit in those IRA funds. Um, so for rental weatherization, real quickly, um, our allies at Rights and Democracy are working on this. Um, they last, uh, they're working on the first step in getting uh, weatherization done for renters, which is to create a um, rental registry. Um, if folks have housing experience, or ex struggles with housing, struggles with renting, struggles with weatherization, um, if you've suffered from high heating bills, eviction, any of that, they would really love to talk with you. Um, and uh, Tom and Caddy are the awesome organizers over there, and you can either reach out to them or also there'll be a place on your form you can check um, and we'll make sure you get connected with them um, if you're interested in helping out with that effort. Uh, rate payer protection. So we um, together collectively got the legislature to pass the very first step in getting a more robust rate payer protection program in Vermont. Um, there, the Public Utilities Commission will be doing a study about this. Um, and so right now, and then hopefully they will make recommendations to the legislature um, in 2026. So 2025 is the first part of the biennium, 2026, hopefully there will be a bill. Um, so if folks are interested in this down the line, there's nothing to do at this moment, but um, please indicate that on your form. Um, you can also, um, writing op-eds about this is a great way to start raising um, discussion and interest in it in your community, sort of in preparation for legislation in 2026. 
Um, and also, um, so later, later this fall, we'll hopefully be helping folks to set up times to talk with their legislators. So it's also something you can talk directly with your legislators about. Um, oops, sorry. Um, improving access to the IRA funds. This is something we really need to do more research and work on. Um, so if folks are interested in that, we're starting um, a statewide justice team, um, and you can reach out to me, um, Rebecca at 350vermont.org, if you're interested in being part of that. Um, now we're gonna try to play a video. Um, so we're, who was here for Thermal Energy Networks when Debbie came? Okay, cool. So we're gonna play a really short video um, about them and then a couple of concrete things you can do. Here in Vermont, heat is a precious resource. We put a lot of time and effort into staying warm in the winter. And we pour a lot of energy and money into making, moving, and saving heat. Meanwhile, all kinds of heat is available for us to capture, move, and share to keep our homes and communities warm. This heat is right under our feet, not far underground where the sun's energy warms the earth to a constant temperature. It's also venting from large buildings like hospitals and hotels, from grocery stores, ice arenas, factories, and breweries. And it's flowing down drains and out of our buildings carried in the water we warm up and use every day. Luckily, it's not hard to recover that heat and reuse it in thermal energy networks. We can find the temperature we need underground at about the depth of a water well. We can also harness it from building ventilation or wastewater. This thermal energy is carried to our homes and businesses by water and a network of pipes. Vertical pipes access heat from underground and return unwanted heat to the earth to be stored as needed. Horizontal pipes not only share heat between buildings, they also capture the heat that's venting from buildings and flowing in wastewater systems, adding it to the network. These pipes form closed loops that move heat where it's needed. Inside, a ground source heat pump amplifies that temperature for heating and hot water. In the summer, the heat pump ejects heat back underground to make buildings cooler, storing that heat for next winter. Using existing heat means less drilling, making thermal energy networks more efficient and cost-effective. An ice rink in Vancouver provides heat and hot water to nearby buildings, the equivalent of 43 homes, by sharing heat that's removed during the freezing process. Maintaining the ice rink is now two to three times more efficient and dramatically reduces fossil fuel use. Another neighborhood in Vancouver is cutting greenhouse gas emissions from buildings in half and meeting about 70% of its heating and cooling needs by recovering heat from a wastewater treatment plant. Lake Louise Inn has cut its propane use by 60% by using wastewater to offset how the resort heats hot water for laundry and guest services. Thermal energy networks are community infrastructure, much like water and sewer systems. We have familiar ways to provide these services that also apply to delivering clean heating and cooling. Thermal energy networks also complement other clean energy solutions. Many Vermonters are installing air source heat pumps as an important house-by-house -house way to heat and cool efficiently, save money, and lower emissions. In town centers and new developments, we can install thermal energy networks as a community scale solution to help more people access and afford clean energy. And we can pair thermal networks with solar to supply local clean electricity to run the system. Experts in clean energy, finance, policy, and planning are working with state and local leaders, businesses, and community members to implement thermal energy networks and help more Vermonters across our state access affordable, reliable heating and cooling. Maybe your town is already doing this, maybe they're not. The first step is really to go to your energy committee and talk with them about it. And um, Debbie knew who we work with a lot and um, 
whose passion is working on this is really happy to come to your committee, your energy committee, and do a whole presentation. Um, we'll send some follow-up resources about this, like step-by-step -step guides on how, for example, an energy committee would think about, if, does this work for our town, does this make sense? Um, I've seen this happen in my town, and it really just started by the energy committee having Debbie New come, and it's totally taken off. I'm in Northfield, so. Um, also, um, yeah, all, all this information we'll send out to you. My computer might be frozen. That's actually never happened before. Um, oh, here we go. This is the this is like the the next big chunk for us. So um, Jonathan is here behind me, all ready to go from Renewable Energy Vermont. Um, he's going to take us through um, what uh, electric electricity from solar and wind could look like. Um, and just before he gets going, just want to mention, I think most folks um, like understand how much we need solar to meet our energy needs if we're really going to address climate change. And like everything in this transition, we really have to think about how solar and energy storage is done. We don't want to end up in our transition recreating just a purely extractive economy, um, which is what got us into this problem in the first place. Um, so we really want to think about questions like who's bearing the brunt of the transition. This slide talks a bit about um, where minerals uh, for solar panels come from and whose communities those are in, mostly um, indigenous land. Um, what can be done about this? So we're not saying we don't build solar panels. We're really excited to have Jonathan here to talk about that. Um, but we need to just be careful about how we do it. So we're thinking about ensuring ethical supply chains, decarbonizing the manufacturing process, improving panel material and efficiency, and also really thinking about recycling and reusing, and then also just going back to what we talked about in the beginning, using less, having, instead of electric cars everywhere, having mass public transport and those sort of things. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks for being Thanks, Rebecca. Um, before I get started, just uh, a little bit of background about myself. Um, Vanessa said her kids were six and three when she started. My kids are six and three now. Um, before coming to Google Energy Vermont, I was at uh, UVM looking at uh, transportation and energy use. Um, and I had moved over to REV when they were like three and, and, and not quite one yet because I wanted to do something that felt like um, was having a more, more immediate impact than writing papers that maybe some people read but, but didn't, didn't change policy necessarily. Um, so REV is uh, an industry group. Um, but I'm here and I'm at REV very much because I think um, growing, growing renewables is crucial to our future. Um, so what I want to talk about specifically today is how we can marry our renewable energy goals and conservation goals in Vermont. We know that transitioning to renewables is very important. Uh, and we know that there are other elements of Vermont's environment that we want to protect while we are doing that. Um, Vanessa mentioned that one of the big successes this past year was we, we passed an update to the renewable energy standard that will get our utilities to 100% renewable electricity by 2030, 2035, depending on the size of the utility. Uh, one of the really big reasons that we needed to do that is because we are reliant on, on the grid. We are connected to the entire New England grid. A big source of uh, the power on the grid is natural gas. They come from plants like, like this one here, which is in Table, Connecticut. It's uh, 60 acres, which uh, yeah, superimpose that over over downtown Montpelier. You can see it goes all the way up to the National Grant, hits the library in Shaw's. So, um, uh, Vanessa also mentioned uh, um, there aren't any of these in in Vermont. There are um, the, the the actual number in New England is there are 64 of them in New England. 62 of those 64 are in communities that have an above average share of children under five, low income households. 40 some percent of those are in communities where all three of those things are true. So there is a real environmental justice issue with how we get power currently, and we need to you know, not just export those harms to, to our neighbors in, in, other, in other states and regions, but make sure that we are uh, bringing at least as much of the energy as feasible home here to, to Vermont where we can ensure that it's developed responsibly. Um, so right now our electricity mix needs to change and it needs to grow. Um, things like weatherization will help us decrease our overall energy use as does moving from uh, you know, 
uh, inefficient fossil fuel boiler to a, to a heat pump. But while our overall energy use may be declining, our electricity use needs to grow because we need to electrify like crazy to get off to get off of fossil fuels. Um, the uh, spacing here is a little wonky, but but this shows where our utilities actually buy power from right now. And there's one green slice here. This uh, in the upper upper right there. That's 19% uh, of our power that uh, utilities currently buy from wind and solar. That's really the only part of our fuel mix that we can grow and meet our, our climate goals. The rest of it is things like system mix, which includes those fossil fuels, nuclear, uh, biomass, large hydro. Those are things that uh, we probably don't want to increase their production scale. And even if we did, we can't grow them as fast as, uh, as our demand is going to grow as we electrify. So it's really all about how do we grow wind and solar uh, to, clean up, to clean up the grid. Um, one part of that was updating the renewable energy standard. Uh, we're now shifting from the, the energy that um, utilities physically purchase, where the electrons that go onto the grid come from, to a system, again, like the clean heat standard that's credit-based. So in order to comply with the renewable energy standard, utilities have to retire RECs. Um, the quality of, of renewable energy credits uh, varies. But what this bill did that we think is really good is it increased the amount of them that has to come from new in-state renewables and new regional renewables. This is what Vanessa mentioned, where we're going to be getting by 2035, 40% of our power from new wind and solar. Um, and this is the stuff that drives development and that forces natural gas off. 60% of that is, is still renewable, but comes from sources that are more ambiguous in their environmental renewable. Uh, comes from sources that are more ambiguous, um, again, to be, to be generous, in their environmental value. So uh, we don't see this, this um, composition as, as being static over time. We want to continue to grow those top two slices. The new in-state uh, requirement, which will likely be met primarily by solar, and a new regional requirement, which will likely larger be uh, things like offshore wind over time. So we want to grow those and shrink the share of the pie that comes from those, those existing renewables. Um, great first step. We're going to keep pushing. All right. So given where we are right now, what would it look like in Vermont to meet that in-state requirement, which remember says we have to get by 2035, 20% of our power from relatively small in-state power sources. Well, right now we come from a mix of rooftop and backyard solar under the net metering program. Um, this kind of solar has really minimal impact on green spaces, um, but it's a higher cost to build than uh, the megawatt scale solar rates. Probably a, 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 on average, a, a megawatt would take about five acres, five acres of land. Um, these larger projects have the, have the lowest cost rate payers. If we continue doing the backyard and, and rooftop at the same rate that we were doing it, we would get about 15% of our in-state power from that and about 85% from these, from these larger, uh, larger solar arrays. That would take about 1,800 acres space outside the, the built environment. Um, to, to put that in context, uh, 1,800 acres is uh, roughly the size of Regen's. Um, the plan would not be to clear all the houses out of Regen's, pave it over and put solar panels there, but of course those would be, be spread throughout the state. Um, but there are there's some other, other things we want to consider as we look at marrying our, our renewable goals with our conservation goals. So one is that we want to be protecting High value habitat, green spaces. This is something that Red supports as well as you know, the broader environmental community. But we also want to recognize that the push to electrify and to get more of this power from in state instead of importing it from, from that plant in Connecticut that's in a neighborhood of, with a bunch of low income kids, um, recognize that, that some impacts in Vermont are, are going to happen. That's you know, kind of part of, part of the bargain of reducing the environmental injustice that we're that we're pushing out elsewhere. Um, uh, just a, a, another slide or two about what that 1,800 acres under the status quo would look like, and then we're gonna talk about what are some policies that we could do that would reduce that 1,800 acres and take some of the pressure off of our, off of our green spaces. Um, first, I wanna highlight that uh, our, our forests and our farmland are legitimately facing real development pressures in Vermont. Uh, 
but then in both cases, that's really coming from uh, sprawl, essentially, you know, residential development. Uh, from between 2001 and, oh, that bottom number is wrong now, I'm sorry, that should be the, the bottom number should be 2016 to 2040, but between, between 2000 and 2040, the, the Farmland Information Center estimates that we have already lost and will continue to lose um, 61, 62,000 acres of agricultural land to, to low density sprawl primarily. Um, in, in contrast, uh, the, the solar projects that were built in Vermont in 2022 that were bigger than 250 kW, these are community scale projects and above, um, impacted fewer than 100 acres of, of primary ag soil. This is not to say that we are content to, to drop 1,800 acres on, on ag soil, um, but to point out um, where where the, where the biggest threats to that, that soil is. Um, similar, very similar issue on, on forest land, uh, where a Harvard study found that we're losing about 1,500 acres a year to, to, to sprawl. Um, uh, we lost four, fewer than 45 acres of, of land covered with trees, not all the forest, not all the high quality, um, <coughs> too. Um, and, and especially with regards to forest, this sort of less of an issue there because it's less uh, appealing to build there because you generally want to be away from forest box, you want to be close to load, uh, don't want to have to do that clearing. Um, however, we also know that we can get that 1,800 acre number down if we change the policy. This is what we would get likely under the status quo, but nobody said we had to be content with the status quo. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of options that can help, help bring that number down. Uh, uh, the first two I want to talk about are uh, community solar, and also anything that reduces our load growth, geothermal networks, um, weatherization efficiency, all those things. Um, on community solar, because those projects tend to be smaller in scale and they can be community owned, both of those things could facilitate integrating these projects more into the built environment uh, in a smaller footprint. And so you, you don't need, you could build them you know, between existing buildings rather than being a, a multi, multi acre swap in there. Um, the construction costs of these, as I mentioned, are, uh, are, are or I should mention, are lower than residential projects. You do have some economy of scale there, but higher than the, the megawatt scale projects. And it's a form of development that the Department of Public Service and the utilities have opposed because they would rather do it with that megawatt scale where the construction costs and therefore the cost of the utilities are the lowest. Um, Lots of, lots of other good values around it, though, so we are, we are definitely interested in promoting and protecting that. But, but that's, that's the counter message that, that um, legislators are hearing. Um, thermal networks, weatherization, and efficiency uh, all reduce load, all reduce our demand for electricity, reduce uh, the amount of new renewables we build. Um, so megawatt is the, the best way to, to reduce emissions. Any, any electricity that we don't use is invaluable. Um, but again, while we're going to be reducing our overall energy use from technologies like this over the next decade, decade plus, um, that is also going to be growing our demand for electricity specifically. So we're going to be reducing energy demand from fossil fuels, increasing it from electricity. Uh, so even as we push harder on these, we're still going to see load grow um, uh, on the electricity side. Um, and the, and the existing targets are in, in, in are relatively aggressive. So being able to surpass them, absolutely something we push to push for, um, not necessarily easy. So what, what would these two things um, say? So all the numbers here are uh, kind of Jonathan's baseline of like what might sound reasonable, um, but it's a real simple Excel model that gets us this acreage out of it. We can plug in other numbers if people are, are curious about it uh, and get to here. So uh, for community solar, if 85% of Vermont's towns committed to building a 500 kW community array in their town, that would be 105 megawatts of solar, of community solar, built in Vermont. If because of that smaller size and because of the community involvement, we can get 75% of that integrated into the built environment, uh, that would reduce green space uh, impacts by 365 acres. So, you know, given thoughtful siting on these and, and statewide commitment, it's actually a pretty big number. Um, Geothermal and weatherization, uh, above and beyond what's already already laid out in the Climate Action Plan, this is an area where I have 
very limited technical expertise. I put 5%, an additional 5% reduction in there just to give us a sense of, of, of what the, how that scale. But if we could get just another 5% reduction uh, in our load, that would uh, also reduce the, the number of green spaces that would be impacted um, by 2030 by another 100, 180 acres. So we're at uh, over 500 acres of savings by, by these two alone. I'm going to touch quickly on, on two others and, and then talk for just a couple minutes about that, that regional piece. Um, other, other alternatives that we can do to reduce impact on green spaces is promote solar canopies. Solar over parking lots, zero impact on green spaces, utilizes some of our lowest value property. Um, wildly popular with everyone I talk to, uh, does cost one and a half to two times as much as building it in a green field. So these will not get built unless there is policy muscle behind it that incentivizes it or mandates it, but a great way to protect green space uh, and build solar. Um, distributed wind is another option. This is small scale wind turbines. Uh, are we doing questions as we go or at the end? That's it. Just a quick question. comment. Yeah. It may cost more to build it over a parking lot than it does to build it in green space, but whoever owns that parking lot saves a lot on following costs in the winter. Right. Yeah, that's true. You got you got to build it tall enough and wide enough to, to make sure that you can right. get the vehicles through. But that but that's de that's yeah, definitely that's true. true. There, it, it makes the park experience more pleasant in the summer because you got shade there. Your yeah, car is right. going to be a million degrees when you get in. I love I love parking lot canopy solar. This picture is from from Lawson's who installed some there. Um, huge fan of it. Would love to see policy muscle that made it a reality. Um, Wind produces more power per megawatt of installed capacity than solar does. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, there are more hours of the year where the wind is blowing harder than the sun is shining harder. Right. Um, and, and that has a smaller footprint on the ground per megawatt than solar. Mm -hmm. uh, these don't have to be ridge line projects. In fact, what we're talking about here for this in-state distributed, this in-state small renewables piece, uh, it couldn't be, it couldn't be those large projects. Uh, this is a, a the picture here is a, 100 kilowatt uh, turbine near the near the Dyna Power facility in South Burlington. You can see it off of 89. Um, again, these yeah, are the. Uh, it's it's so um, a one megawatt turbine would offset uh, 10,000 panels. So dividing both of those by 10, this would this would um, produce as much power as a thousand a thousand. Panels. Oh, wow. Right. Dependent, dependent on siding. There's, you know, you're going to get more on the mountain top than you are there, but but this is still going to give you, you know, a good chunk of power. It's questionable whether it's cost effective against solar. Small wind is pretty much dead. Exactly. So again, this is, this is something that if we wanted to, if we wanted to do some, some land use trade offs, if this is something we want to incentivize, these are all things that would take policy changes to make happen. Under the status quo, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to continue to do net metering on rooftops and backyards, and we're gonna build projects that are probably three to five megawatts in size because those are most cost effective. And I think part of the point of this is to say we have choices, right? And we get to decide what makes sense, and, and it's gonna take organizing. But I think that we really need to think about what is the energy future we want to build together. Um, so that's sort of the, the foundation of this presentation. One more question back over here, and then Dan will get you get you next. But then what about like the the commercial building policy that requires commercial buildings and government buildings to have solar? I mean, all those new buildings went up in Burlington. I don't think along you know near the whale tails. I don't think any of them have solar. So you know, what kind of policy, is that a policy we could potentially pass? Yeah, there are, there are some um, municipalities in Vermont that have done solar ready, at least. I, I don't think there are any that have said solar required, but they said that the roof must be solar ready. Um, so we can definitely do things like that in the building code that make it much more likely that those, those buildings will have solar on them. Um, great way to, great way to protect, protect green spaces. <laughs> So, uh, Dan, quick, and then I'm going to just wrap up here. Well, it's a uh, question that seems to be saying we're not supposed to raise the rates on people because that's uh, uh, intrusive. However, wouldn't raising the rates 
make people more uh, interested in wind at uh, these level uh, where the NIMBYs don't want them uh, because wind is the most predictable uh, source of things compared to a solar. Um, and uh, it would seem to me that we're not making a enough, strong enough case around wind. My, my perspective on wind and solar is that they're incredibly complementary resources and that we want to be doing as much as we can to accelerate both of those. As people know, larger scale wind has been very contentious in Vermont. Um, yeah. But, but, but they're, they're really complementary resources. And to address climate as quickly and effectively as possible, we would want more of both of those. Uh, I'm going to get back to Linus here, and then I've got just I think two or three slides on offshore wind, and then we'll wrap and pending Vanessa's clock watching, uh, might have time for another question or two. Or I have my emails on here, happy to follow up with people afterwards also. Um, so uh, if we installed um, 40 megawatts of parking lot canopies, that'd be 10% of our in-state requirement. That would save 200 acres uh, of green space versus building this on larger projects. Um, if we got just 5% from distributed wind, again, this would take changes to incentives for these projects to be viable. Um, that would uh, save another 90 acres. So across all four of these potential policy-driven changes, um, we'd be talking about knocking about 800 acres out of, off of that initial 1,800-acre estimate. Um, so to Vanessa's point, there are things that we can do if we decide collectively that we value them and that we want to do that. Um, that will make hitting those renewable targets, which we think are fantastic and, in fact, things that we want to expand, um, uh, more aligned with some of our, our conservation goals, which are also important. Um, I'm going to touch base for just a minute on that new regional requirement. So again, by 2035, 20% of our power is going to be coming from small in-state projects. Under the current environment, that's mostly solar. Another 20% can come from projects throughout New England uh, that are larger in scale. This offers the potential for some cost savings for utilities if they're, if, as projected, these costs come down over time. Um, and uh, off, off, uh, offers them a way to buy power from sources that are generating the most in the winter and overnight when our solar is generating the least. Um, so how this, this requirement will likely be met is that uh, renewable energy credits uh, generated already by Kingdom Community Wind and other wind projects in Vermont that are currently sold to Connecticut so that their utilities can satisfy their requirement. Those will be retired in Vermont. The Connecticut utilities will be required to help build new projects to meet, to meet their goals. Um, and then uh, new offshore wind is likely to be the other place that's the other place the utilities have targeted to, to meet this. Um, these are uh, a couple of images of uh, Coastal energy infrastructure off the coast of Massachusetts. Um, uh, we've got the, the Mystic uh, natural gas generating station and the um, truly massive uh, uh, barges that help supply that with liquid natural gas that comes from you know, as far away as Algeria. Mm -hmm. And then we've got um, uh, some, of the, some of the offshore wind turbines that are um, now going up uh, in that region. Is that Rock Island? Uh, this one, I think, is, uh, this is the, the Block Island wind farm. There's a little tag that's sort of moved a smidge. Um, yeah, so we, we do have some offshore wind projects that are delivering power now. We've got a bunch that are in development. Um, a couple of things about offshore wind before, before I wrap. It's a, it's a very ample resource. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Massachusetts and Rhode Island just committed to buying nearly uh, 3,000, power from nearly 3,000 megawatts of wind. And that's enough to power 1.6 million homes. For Vermont to hit that 20% that share, um, we would need to get you know, power from just about 200 megawatts of wind. And, and the, the potential out there is, is really ample. Um, and as I said, um, from a, like a physics perspective of power when you need it, the fact that the wind is blowing the most in the winter and overnight uh, really means we need to do less, less storage, we'll still need storage, uh, and we need to do less protection. So uh, that's likely a big part of the answer for that uh, regional piece. Um, my email address is just my first name, Jonathan, uh, at revermont.org. I don't know if we have any time now, or if people can also follow up by email. Yeah, let's follow up. Okay, yeah, so follow up by email. Uh, any questions, and, and thanks. Yeah. 
Thanks for uh, your attendance and pressure. Thank you, Jonathan. We're so lucky to have an organization like Rev and so many amazing allies, right, in this state. It's pretty amazing to, to get to work with everybody. Um, so you've heard a lot of information tonight, um, and I'm sure it's feeling a little bit overwhelming, but um, the point is that there are so many things we can do. What is getting in the way of us getting there is just not enough people asking for it. So. We really want to encourage you to get involved if you're not already. Um, and I'm going to pass the mic to Andres. Just gonna say this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's some handouts that Vanessa's going to be handing out um, where folks can sign up and check a box to indicate what particular issue you want to tackle if you're interested in. Milana, think about it a little bit longer. Um, we're excited to work with each of you in ways that feel like connect to your heart and your energy what sites you look really good to. Um, and so as we wrap up our time tonight, um, I'm just gonna do a little popcorn and a little bit of thinking as you fill out the sheet. Um, also think about like the question that we began with, like what brings you to this space, what motivates you? Maybe think about who are the people that you think about? Rebecca mentioned her kiddos, Vanessa mentioned her kiddos. Who are the people that it motivate you to do the climate action work that you are here to do? Um, and folks can do some pop popcorning, share out, but um, want to give a moment for folks to fill out the sheet um, before we close and share out. Thanks, everybody. different strands of work and getting a sense of sort of, you know, what, what people might be excited to work on is going to help us decide where to put some of our energy. Um, so as I said, we're going to be hosting these across the state and gauging what, what resonates with people. And you can just drop off the, the form if you filled it out um, on the table before you leave. I did forget to say on the solar front that one of our big priorities this session is to introduce a bill to make community solar affordable. Um, how many of you heard last year that um, this thing called off-site group net metering was taken out of the renewable energy standard? So um, basically, the utility said, yes, we'll increase the requirements for solar and wind. But in exchange, you need to take offset group net metering out of, the, out of the standard. And that thing was basically how community solar was funded. Um, the people who negotiated the deal felt that it was an OK trade to make, and we actually we supported that as well in the end because we thought getting those increased goals first was the most important thing. The existing program really wasn't working very well um, and there wasn't a whole lot of community solar being built. Um, but we committed to this year passing a bill to fix that um, because we really want to incentivize that. So we're currently in the process of making that happen and we're going to need all the people who care about community solar um, to raise their voice and call their legislators and write letters to the editors. So if that's something that you care about, you want to see more of, um, just check that off. And it doesn't mean you need to join a group, it just means you know we need to call you if we need somebody to um, 
to talk to their legislator or testify or something like that. But you're saying we shouldn't do anything with wind at all. Wind is just off the Really, for this year, so in terms of, to recap, I don't know if we have a recap, yeah, to review. Um, we can't do everything all at once. So this year what we're doing is we're trying to pass, uh, we're trying to introduce a bill to make community solar affordable. That's one of the first things we're trying to do. We want to keep biofuels out of the clean heat standard as much as we can by making sure that they're well, um, that, that, that their pollution level is accurately reflected. Um, that's not in the legislature at this point. It's really submitting comments to the Public Utility Commission. Um, that's at the state level. Um, the third thing we want to do at the state level is weatherize rental units. The first step is to create a landlord registry. So there's a bill being introduced. So we have three bills that we're sort of following closely. Community solar, clean heat standard, and rental weatherization. At the local level, we want to funnel that federal money into communities um, in order to start the transition. We don't need all the legislation in the world. We can actually start making a difference. There's a ton of money to do thermal energy networks, heat pumps, weatherization. So we want to make sure people have access to that. We need to restore the funds for public transportation, which is going to happen somewhat at the local level, but also at the, at the state level uh, with the governor's transportation budget. So we will be advocating for that. And then, you know, engaging your energy committees in your towns to look into thermal energy networks, because that's something we can start doing. They don't need to wait for, um, for anything else. Um, and then on the, you know, if you are in Burlington or if you're in the Northeast Kingdom, we want to stop. Um, Biomass plants. So that does that answer your question? Okay. Are there any other questions before we close? Yeah. Not so much a question as a comment. Um, can I borrow this? Thank you. So I was privy to a conversation a little earlier this evening where someone was explaining that situation with net metering and how it negatively affects utilities and another participant in the conversation said, well, screw the utilities. Um, it's an understandable sentiment, but think of it this way. Utilities have a block of machinery and infrastructure they have to maintain in order to serve um, their customers, the people that are attached to that system. And when one party begins to net meter, they're now using that infrastructure to move electricity around, but they're not paying for it anymore. And then when another one does that, there's another party that's doing that. And eventually you get to a situation where there's 10 or 20% of the people attached to the system that are using it to import electricity when they need it and export electricity when they don't need it, but they're not helping financially to support the system any longer. And that's why the utilities don't like it. It's not just because they're money grubbers and want to, you know, right. enrich their stockholders. It's because it just, it's an unsustainable model. Well, GMP is being enriching its stockholders, especially in the front of it. Could, uh, could, I, could, I, could I finish, please, without the interruption? So, just two more minutes, because it's yeah. five. So, <clears throat> I think the impetus behind getting rid of new, uh, group net metering is because those are kind of like, you know, um, getting the low hanging fruit, getting the ones that really do the most damage to the bottom line, number one. And number two, often with group net metering, the array is in one town and the off taker is, you know, 50 miles away. And that involves a whole lot more infrastructure than when somebody has an array on the roof and the off taker is under the same roof. So, my point about it is the legislature loves unfunded mandates. They like to make stuff happen without having to raise taxes because raising taxes gets them booted out of there. So what they do is they make the utilities pay the cost of subsidizing solar. And that's why we have this problem with net metering. If we um, socialize the cost of net metering and just simply said we're going to raise the funding we need to incentivize people building solar without passing expense onto the other ratepayers who don't have solar, 
then you wouldn't have this shift of cost going on to the folks who aren't paying, who aren't net meters. And it's a, there's a much more to the story than that, but I, I don't like the fact that utilities vilify net metering, but I also don't like the fact that in a group like this we're vilifying utilities as if they're the bad guys in the room, because, you know, say what you want about um, uh, privately owned um, corporations, they do have to make some money, and cooperatives just simply have to make, remain solvent. No, totally. That's a point well taken. And to be clear, the, um, the utilities that... So in Vermont, we have one. Green Man Power is a cor corporate-owned utility. It's owned by a gas company in Canada. Um, gas Metro. Yeah, Gas Metro and then beyond. Um, the utilities that pushed up, pushed against off-site group net metering were the small publicly owned utilities. And for the reasons that you say, um, that's why we said that the offsite group net metering wasn't working well because it really wasn't incentivized. It was too expensive, uh, which is why we're interested in introducing a bill because we still need community solar, but that wasn't the way to do it. Um, so well, it's it's fine to put a, a solar array in some dump somewhere where that it's not going to do any it's not going to do any damage to the view shed because it's already ugly and have that, the off-taker be 50 miles away as long as the system is set up to pay for the utility to move the electricity back and forth. The current system yeah. doesn't do that. Some utilities have more power than others and more True. money than others. Um, and so I think, you know, we are still talking about corporate profits and, um, you know, it's really hard to imagine a for-profit utility saying, oh, we're going to uh, shift the way we do business when they're accountable to the next quarter shareholder earnings, uh, which really is how it works. So anyways, I just want to close off uh, the conversation. Thank you for being here tonight. It was a lot of information. Um, and if there's one thing you take away is that there's a ton of work to be done. And um, this isn't going to happen without people power. And so we really invite you to join us. and. Um, a lot of the work that we do is actually at the very local level. Um, this is really big picture that what we shared tonight to try to say like, here's you know how this all fits together. It was when the rubber meets the road. But really where the rubber meets the road is in your community uh, with your local node. And we really support nodes to work on what they're interested in working on um, in a way that's consistent with our statewide goals. So Heather, do you want to say anything before you close? Or Becky, you want to say something? Yes, we'll be sending um, the slides. I think Orca Media has recorded the meeting, so you can always go back to that. Um, you can talk to Andres or myself or Rebecca. Rebecca is actually the organizer for the Montpelier area. Um, and so, and we have a lot of resources uh, on this table over there, info sheets and things like that. Any other questions before we close? Can I add something, Vanessa? Yeah. Just housekeeping, if you have your forms, please make sure I get them, or Vanessa or Andres. And also, if you have sticky notes with questions, if you can make sure your name and contact info is on there, and just to get separated from your form so that we know who to get back to. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, and I'll stick around, so please come talk to me too if you're in Montpelier and, uh, or in Central Vermont and want to get involved. All right, thanks everybody, good night.